go into a little spa sparring fight. All right, <clears throat> so why am I here? Uh, who here reads XKCD? Okay, so these two guys up there, sorry, my laser pointer doesn't really work very well here. So these two guys up here are kind of like actually summing up quite well a situation I regularly find myself in. So I talk with people either over dinner or walking down the street or anywhere, and one said, oh, I heard that blah, 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 like here. I heard that water is good for you, but you shouldn't drink too much because, yeah, I don't even know, like why not? Right. So this is usually the moment where people dig out their phones and try to like f do some on-the-fly research on why you shouldn't drink too much water. Okay. So if you're lucky, you find the Wikipedia page. This is usually the thing that people then read. And if it's not on Wikipedia, then they may glimpse on web search, but they will not spend more than, I think, uh, 30 seconds on actually finding the true answer because then dinner arrived and they're like, oh, well, it, wouldn't, it wasn't so important, so let's talk about something else. So wouldn't it be great if, I mean, that's kind of like the moment where you can actually teach society something important, like about water poisoning and how water poisoning could or could not be related to sun poisoning, um, what you should drink, what you should not drink, about nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of like missing out on that and most of and we're kind of just missing out because we don't have good information systems to help us find what we're looking for. So. Um, I call myself an information retrieval researcher, which is, um, wasn't always the case. I think at some point I called myself a machine learner, then I called myself an NLP person, then I called myself, or even before that, I called myself a semantic web person. So I've been all these different kind of people and I call myself an information retrieval researcher because they are all, ultimately the problem is helping people find what they're looking for. I think it was also called databases at some point. I, I, I'm just, uh, if you're a machine learner, <laughs> okay, we will see how far we so get with that. <laughs> All right, so great. I'm on slide one and I'm already getting questions like that. Uh, so the title of the talk is Retrieving Complex Answers Through Knowledge Graph and Text. Um, Right, so complex answers, um, yeah, that's kind of like uh, maybe the first thing to talk about. So what I talk, what I kind of like my motivation may remind you, we may, may remind you a little bit of question answering. I, I think it's a little bit like question answering without a question, and I get more to that. But actually, it's also question answering without a concise answer. So it's QA without Q or A. So uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So let's maybe first talk about what is knowledge. And here's my maybe pragmatic definition. I already got into some sparring fights with some philosophers. Um, everything that's on Wikipedia, I think, is a good prototype for knowledge. But not everything that's text is knowledge. Uh, for example, here, this um, tweet on, yay, go Brexit. It's information. I wouldn't exactly call that one knowledge. So this is where I draw the line. Um, here's uh, what's a knowledge graph. So we have. Um, entities, for example, Wikipedia entities, but the whole thing translates also to other kinds of ontologies, whatever you prefer. Where we have, for instance, the United Kingdom, the other one, Theresa May, we have Brexit, so how are they related to each other through a graph structure? For instance, we know that Theresa May is a prime minister of the United Kingdom, good. Maybe we also know that she's in favor of the Brexit, but then often we have some kind of like a relationship that might even be like untyped, like an article link or some co-occurrence. We know that there is some kind of connection, but we can't easily attach a predicate to it. Okay. So um, that's what I call a knowledge graph. Some people also call it a link graph. So I think the trajectory, there's like a, like a spectrum of, of definitions here. So it's um, maybe kind of like the, well, we just have data and we try to make the best out of it. Um, when I said answering complex, uh, or complex answers, right? Um, then I need to talk about what are the kind of information needs that I want to address. So here's a couple of them, uh, and they all share that they require some long, complex answers to be properly answer, uh, addressed. For instance, like here's drink water good. So these are not even like written in a kind of question form, but of course, whenever I put something in my favorite search engine, there is a kind of question that's kind of like always in the background. But maybe I don't need to pass the question if I already get a user trained to just enter the kind of keywords like that. So yeah, for instance, drink water good, that's kind of like this question here, or dark chocolate health benefit, which is actually 
great because it's a nice example where web search constantly fails and then uh, I'm like, I have this like podcast addiction. Does anybody hear of the podcast Science Versus? If not, if you kind of like, like these kind of questions, you should check it out. They recently had an episode on um, chocolate, coffee and wine and whether it's good for you or not and it completely contradicted everything that the web search engine usually finds here. Yeah? So when you say this query failed, um, so I just tried to clear it and as I expected I got like many, many uh, pages that were directed to them that they... They tried to they sell you something? They, they offer a long time yeah. to answer some questions. Oh yeah, yeah. That you need to do synthesis across those to try to sort out Okay, so yeah, we, there's like the synthesis, but I think in particular they are all telling you something that's not necessarily the truth according to what our latest state of the art in, so in science is. Not, is not your whole goal. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we also want to like, you know, educate, that we want to tell the, the truth to users, and I will not make this talk about fake news, although I know that there are people also very interested in that, yeah. Okay. Um, also, so the problem is not, is not uh, actually finding. I mean, I, I guess the question is, when people are asking questions like these, um, how many of them do you just get like random stuff that you weren't looking for? I did a query this morning, I can't remember what, uh, where it seemed obvious to me what I was asking, and yet the pages were just doing random keyword matches. And That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that the common case here? Or oh, that's actually often the case, at least for, for my web searches. I kind of like very often run into that where well, I guess because nobody else cared for this kind of question, I just get a bunch of random stuff back. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in this particular case, if you try it, you find, I think, uh, the top 20 at the very least are all pages that try to sell you like a nutritional supplement, which actually, if you know about the science, is not necessarily the thing that you should actually buy to be healthy. Okay, but that's a different story. Um, but I think that's like a, definitely like a compact question where you can talk about a lot of different things. Like what are the chemical compounds in chocolate that could make it healthy or unhealthy? Um, and if it's healthy, then why? And how does this actually help the human body of kind of like fighting diseases? So there's a whole long story you should tell me about this to actually give me a, like a reasonable answer about this. Of course, you can say yes, and here, please buy my nutritional supplement. But that's maybe kind of like a little bit um, unfortunate. Okay. Um, okay, here another one, uh, cash flow important for investment. This is kind of like born out of me not really knowing much about finance, but trying to come up with a question in this direction. So this is something I would like to know. So, uh, and I don't really know much about finance, so I can't even phrase the right question. And still, I think you should maybe identify what is the thing that I want to know here, and maybe also anticipate what is the thing that I wanted to know after this, right? It's like not like a question answering system where you first ask one question, and another question, and another question, but you can already anticipate other questions that I might ask after you answer this one. Um, and here's another one. Diesel scandal affect Daimler AG, that means like, you know, incorporated. <clears throat> so how does the diesel scandal, which very much affected the Volkswagen group, um, is actually affecting this other car manufacturer in Germany, which I think it's a legal question to ask, right? Uh, and in all of these questions, uh, even if there is a short answer to any of these topics, that's not really what we're looking for here. We look for the long answers, like tell me if yes, why, if not, why not, and tell me the backstories and the interesting stuff. I may want to hear about this. Okay. Any questions regarding this? So I'm, I'm now interpreting your phrase, complex answers, to mean something slightly different than what I thought earlier. What did you think what it? What you mean is that there are many facets to the answer, and current search engines might give you the dominant facet, like, you know, the, the most frequent, the most obvious, the most repeated aspect. And there might be another aspect to the answer which is less, less, less frequent, less obvious, less the search in the text, and you might get that as well. So you almost want to look at all the aspects of the answer as equal, even though they're not tested equally, and you get all the tests. Some of this, but I think there's also another nuance in that some answers just require that you give me that you that you give me more than just a sentence. So it's not just there's like one dominant fact and then there are other alternative facts. Um, but it's you know especially if I want to understand 
whether dark chocolate is healthy or not, you need to tell me about theobromine, you need to tell me about certain studies that link theobromine to possibly something that could be helping. You need to tell me about how, how chocolate is manufactured and which of these different kinds of chocolate have most of that theobromine. So it's not just so it's, it's really that you need to tell me the story around that for me to really be informed on that topic. Clear? How should I buy a laptop? Oh, that's also like a great, it's a great complex question, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, right. Um, let's maybe focus on this one question um, and look at what we could do here, right? So as I said, the first thing I usually do, I don't know about you, maybe you have a secret source, I usually go to Wikipedia and try to find something about that topic. Wikipedia, um, if you go to the Daimler website, Daimler Wikipedia page, you will not find any mentions of this. If you go to this Volkswagen emission scandal, you find this one sentence down here that will mention that maybe the stock prices is a little bit affected. But it doesn't really give you a good synthesis for why. Um, if you go to <coughs> web search, um, I think here you actually find some useful information, but you have to do all the work yourself. In some ways, it finds you documents, but you need to look through all these documents, kind of like marker them, uh, identify, well, what are the important concepts here, and how are they connected, and why are they connected, and what does this have to do with what I actually wanted to know? So in some ways, maybe you want to have more like a synthesis of that. And that's actually probably why many people like to turn to Wikipedia. It's kind of like a longer answer, but still is very concise and pretty like structured. So um, web search is, even if it finds you the stuff that you want to look for, you kind of like left to do all the manual work here. All right, so what I think, wouldn't it be great if we do away with web search and instead we have a system that does something like that? So I say query, which means this is the topic for an article. And now I want the machine to write that article for me, um, which includes uh, some predominant facts about the topic and then some more details and stories in some further sections, uh, maybe some images and maybe some tabular information that's uh, relevant here. So can I try answering no to your question? You can, but I would like to have the long answer. Okay, so I'll give you the long answer. Um, so the beautiful thing about web search is that I might be looking for something different than you're looking for, or I might think that the uh, what's important is different from what you think is important. So if you build a system that can make me this in the community's opinion, we can make sort of the Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe we'll sort of uh, dumb down society and, you know, maybe we'll have to think my way uh, or your way or, or mm -hmm. Well, since you already machine generate this one, there's nothing to prevent us to have your Wikipedia page on that topic and my Wikipedia page on that topic. Huh? The Dogpedia. Yeah, the Dogpedia. I mean, it's like we shouldn't even call it Wikipedia anymore because they have like particular kinds of rules of what goes on and what does not go on, but something that feels and smells and tastes a little bit like what we get from Wikipedia. Thank you. All right. So, um, right, so we have this query, we want to generate the thing, and in the middle we, for instance, use a knowledge graph, we use web materials, pretty much like any kind of resource that we can lay our hands on to do this task. Okay, so maybe this task is a little bit big to do it in one paper, or even like in five papers. So um, we came up with a simpler task, which first of all, um, I don't just give you the query, but I also maybe give you an outline of the query. Um, just like, uh, as like a warm-up task, so with the hope that uh, maybe in a year or so we take this heading structure um, away from you and you have to like do that task as well, but just to like get us started on something. And the other thing is like instead of really generating this like nice, you know, blocks of natural language and the image and the table, let's just treat it as kind of like, let me, let me, let's find passages that should go here. So with the idea that um, we can create something like a ransom letter of that page that you're trying to generate, uh, which looks really like uh, clunky and not very nice, not very with nice uh, flowing language, but so that a human could take that information and could write an article from it. And then we can like, uh, talk to some other people in, maybe in this room to maybe how can we turn that uh, clunky language into some nice language. So we just break it into smaller chunks. And in this talk, we just focus on Given these two things, can we find these uh, like these snippets that should go there? 
Um, this is actually exactly the setup of the track track that I was that I'm actually uh, organizing um, called Track Complex Answer Retrieval. We just finished the first year and we have noticed that we actually will do a second year. So if you find any of this interesting, reach out and participate. So it's um, always interested in that. Does this also answer Doug's concern that now you and he might have the same query, but you might have a different Oh, that's a great year three question. Let's me. Fr I think this is already hard enough, so let's first do this really well, and then we get to the Duggarpedia and to um, all these other kind of problems that like depend I'm on. I think you're going to tell me there that if you specify a different set of headings than he does, then for the same thing you're expressing a different information. That's a good point, but also. <laughs> I mean, you can also think about different levels of expertises, like Doug knows so much more about certain topics than I do. But so you want to really take that one into consideration. You want to take maybe uh, tastes or like what am I generally interested in also into consideration. So I think you can, you can take this into a whole other direction for many, many more years. But I think this is like the problem that if we solve that one first, it will enable doing more in that direction. So right now, we should just think of the heading as a chief. Right, or maybe think about um, maybe a journalist that wants to do the topic, so they say, okay, here's a new thing, and I want to know about facets A, B, and C. I think it's already something useful. Actually, I have a friend that works uh, for like a fair labor assessment company, so they're like a nonprofit. So they are getting uh, a new industry in a new region with kind of like a particular focus where they're trying to evaluate is this company, is this person, are they like kosher or were there like some issues with respect to um, unfair labor in the past. So they have to do this kind of research. They want to know well, how is the structure in this particular region. So they kind of like really have that topic and an outline in mind what they are looking for. So I think. Um, solving this kind of task and doing it really, really well, I think it's definitely useful. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, right. So here's the URL if you want to participate. Here's a little bit about the data set that we have today. Um, so we took 200 million pages from the English Wikipedia at the moment. We kind of like expanding it towards multilingual, hopefully soon. We are in the progress. So we have 2 million pages like this. Uh, we have 20 million paragraphs that's like after we already aligned them and removed some redundancy because there is a high level of redundancy on Wikipedia with paragraphs just being copied around, right? Um, we selected a query subset of 260 pages, um, pages that I personally find interesting because I figured, well, if I have to reach the point where I have to do some annotations, at least I want to do it about a topic I care about. And um, in these 260 pages, we have like 3,300 headings in total, which is you know, kind of like these guys here, um, which we first split into two half training and test, and then the training part we split into five folds so that uh, when different people write papers about that, at least we have some synchronized folds to actually know whether the comparison is fair. Um, we kind of like have two kinds of ground truths which is kind of funny, but uh, it's um, what well, it was an experiment. But the first one is what I call automatic, which we generate by, you know, we kind of like take a page as it is on Wikipedia, we identify the outline and the paragraphs. Now we, like separating egg white and egg yolk, we just take these apart, have our outline here and all the paragraphs we put on one pile and shake them, right? This is how we create this corpus, so of course we know where one paragraph originally came from, that's what we use for the automatic ground truth. I just realized that these numbers here don't match up. This is because this is only the test part. So on the test part, we have 6,000 paragraphs that are positive labels, and we can also do the same thing with entities because we know which paragraphs link to certain entities, so we assume that these entities are also relevant. That's just a kind of slightly dumb ground truth, which we can create for all of Wikipedia, so we have tons and tons and tons of training data. Um, and then, of course, because you, know, you show me an article and I can almost certainly come up with a better article, we kind of like wanted to keep an open mind that what's currently on Wikipedia is not the only true answer, because I mean, ultimately we want to do a better thing like that, right? So we uh, had NIST helping us out in creating manual annotations based on what's called a pool-based pool -based assessment, where we had all our participants submitting their runs. We get the top N out of that one, throw them all together, and then uh, NIST had some annotators that they hired, which then said, um, 
kind of like must be mentioned, should be mentioned, could be mentioned. Then we had a category like, oh, this is like roughly on topic, but not really relevant or simply completely non-relevant. So we had this like graded assessment, which is uh, very in total we have 30,000 paragraphs with positive and negative assessments um, and the same thing uh, and 10,000 entities. Okay, this is just the data set that we have today in case you want to work on it. Yes. Ah, okay. So we take um, one, par one, one page. So we have the paragraph. The paragraphs usually have links to other Wikipedia pages. Okay. So if if there is a link to another page, we and that, according to my definition, is an entity. So now that entity is a ground truth entity for this for this heading in this article. So this is what the automatic one said, and uh, for the manual one, we actually ask participants to not just give us an entity, but also give us like a support passage. And then we showed both of these things to the annotator and said, okay, does this passage convince you that this entity belongs there? Um, mostly because it's the only way to really create like a, like a reusable benchmark uh, with multiple annotators and get a good agreement. Yes. No, they're separate. Yeah. But we ask with your entity ranking to also give us these support passages. And if you didn't give us one, we just chose the first one from the article, which is not ideal, but it, I mean, in previous work, I found that that at least gives you, like, in half of the cases, a good, a good support. So, two questions. Now, as I'm looking at the NLP page on Wikipedia right now, um, is NLP an entity or is it just a group of entities? Because I know that Okay, so um, for the manual evaluation, syntax inside manual evaluation is, a, is one of these headings. So you kind of have like this hierarchy here. Um, and I think what many of my students usually do, they take this whole thing and, for instance, pretend that that's a query and do some passage retrieval with this one. Um, in the automatic one, we actually have uh, three more different kinds of ground truths. So we give you this per article, per hierarchical heading, or per top-level heading, assuming that these top-level headings is maybe something that you may want to already start playing with, which may be a little bit easier task, but better defined. Yes? One last question. Okay. Oh, by any chance, would you know how many of those two million pages have cross-lingual links in Ah, so actually, um, so these are just the English ones. I, huh. so I, I used that information for this like multilingual Wikipedia or like a track car experiment that I'm doing. And we looked it up for, I think, Italian. So it was actually the other way around. So I looked at all Italian pages and I asked which of those have a known translation to an English page. Right, I mean, these like two million, these are like just like all pages on Wikipedia, right? And I can look it up and can send you an email if you're interested, but I think it was maybe half or maybe a third. So there is, so there, so there was a, a, a good overlap, but of course, first of all, the Italian Wikipedia is smaller than the English Wikipedia, but then they all ha also have like their, you know, typical Italian entities that maybe English doesn't care about, like different kinds of pasta where they are getting like very ramped up. Like never put never put meatballs on spaghetti if you have a dinner with a true Italian. Right. So I think there's definitely a, a multilingual aspect towards um, doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Also, you can think about you know any kind of question regarding uh, U.S. skepticism, right? So you have different countries inside Europe. They uh, have different languages, but they also have different opinions about certain things, right? So can we maybe study how does maybe a Hungarian view uh, the problem of immigration rather than a German, right? So you don't, it's not just like an exact translation, but they actually may talk about different things because they care about different things. So it's, um, yeah. Interesting question, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> Let's maybe go back to the talk if you don't mind. All right. 
So, uh, of course, we chose some random, uh, like semi-random query subset according to my liking. If you have any particular strong feelings about a certain set of topics, come and talk to me. We have already the pipeline to do all of this uh, in place. It's just like pressing a button. Um, so reach out, send me, send me an email if you care about that. All right. So, okay. So let's maybe play through generating this article here. Right? I said, uh, diesel scandal, how does it affect the Daimler, Daimler Incorporated? Any idea how could we start doing this? When we come like ultimately we want to do it first ourselves and then we want to teach computers how to do this? Any takers? Ah, okay. Well, the, on this topic, I think there is no Wikipedia page because I was like uh, searching for it. So how can we generate this page that doesn't already exist? Okay. Search for these words. Okay, good. And? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's actually that I, I I really like that idea. So you can treat it as like a template filling kind of problem, where you take that template and you ask, well, do I find evidence for this sentence, but with Volkswagen replaced with Daimler, right? So it's that's actually I, I like this one uh, very much. So um, here's maybe another way to think about it. So we will first try to identify which entities are central for this topic. And we'll talk a little bit about how we could actually do this. Uh, Daimler Incorporated, that's maybe an easy one to guess because that was already uh, here in the, in, in, the, in the heading here. So we can run entity linking on this heading and we already have Daimler, but how do we find these other guys here, right? Um, what's that? Okay. okay. Um, so what, once we have the central entities, let's assume we have a magic algorithm to do that, then I would maybe care how are they related to each other? And maybe what's also very important, which of these relations are actually still on topic? Because it's very easy to, if you go like out in the wild, you do one step and you come back in a different kind of topic. So how can we identify which are the relevant relations? And then once we have these relevant relations, maybe we can ask, can we maybe find support passages that talk about these relations, especially the ones that we thought were relevant? and maybe put them even like in a relevant context. I mean, we wanted to have some information where the user can actually do some reading and can say, ah, now I understand how Volkswagen was in, is related to diesel engines with respect to this kind of topic, okay? So um, once we have this, now we can take these passages and just like arrange them into an article. Yes? Wait, what, what are the blue tags on this? The blue tags, so these here? No, no, no. Are, are these in your mind, or are those phrases that you're going to retrieve? You mean the, the bold ones, or these guys? The, 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 those things, the things that look like luggage tags that are flying. <laughs> exactly, they are luggage tags. Good, uh, yeah. So these are um, entities that have some names dangling off of them. Okay. So those are entities? So these are entities, so yeah. So a lawsuit is an entity? Is yeah. A yeah. lawsuit in general, or this particular lawsuit? Um, so lawsuit has a Wikipedia page. I started with everything that has a Wikipedia page as an entity in my vocabulary. Okay, so this is ge the generic concept of a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, yeah. So this is not what I usually think of as meta. I don't know. Okay. That's why what that was asking me for. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good. Um, and so the is the idea of the uh, given the original question. You're trying to find these other entities as things that you would like to find passages that mention. So, you know, are they sort of questions that you think somebody ought to be asking in order to find out about this, mm. and then you're putting them in as subqueries? So, I imagine it as if I want to write this article. What are the kind of concepts or entities or topics or events that I want to mention it in that article? Like if I want to give like a more uh, like all encompassing answer to someone who wants to read this, right? What is the kind of like things that I want to put there? And I, and I kind of just made this up based on what, how I want this article to look like. I think I want to talk about Volkswagen automotive because that's kind of like the whole area, but diesel engines, uh, nitrogen oxide, emissions test, um, the West Virginia University who was actually running these emission tests and kind of like kicked off the Volkswagen diesel scandal. Um, and then the lawsuit and the fines and how that actually affected the stock prices. So these are the kind of like different elements of my story that I want to talk about. Okay. 
And then I want to talk about how they relate. Huh? And you haven't told us yet. How that's right. Know. Yeah, this is just like how I think, uh, what I think would be like a cool approach, given that, you know, of, of course you can do it the other way around, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's 60 slides, okay. Um, all right, so, okay, so in, in my vision, what we, for instance, could do that's just like one out of many approaches. We could then find these uh, support passages and just now think about how can we arrange the, those into an article, okay. So if we want to do this, um, we would need to first find out what are the central entities, how are they connected, which of these connections are actually relevant for this topic, and um, then how, t how can we like, uh, um, can, we, can we find the support passages and organize this knowledge into an essay? So this is actually the outline of my talk, for which I have another, how many minutes? 20. Good. Talking about the problem is like the most important part anyways. Um, all right, so can I really, t maybe I should have the slide earlier, like what is an entity? Everything that's on the knowledge base and has a Wikipedia article, in my mind, is an entity, which is not always the same. Uh, not everybody agrees with this. So here, for instance, we have a Daimler Incorporated as one entity. The Volkswagen emission scandal is another entity, and you can imagine many more of those. All right. Oh, and we uh, can take these and we can cr create something like an entity search index, where a very stupid uh, um, alternative here is to just take all of Wikipedia and just index it. Okay, this is what this little cartoon icon here means. Or we can have a more structured knowledge base, like I say, free base, but you can just like derive like different fields out of them and you can still throw them in a, in a full text search index if you desire to do so. Uh, who here knows what entity linking is? Okay, that's uh, okay, enough. So uh, for those that didn't raise their hands, it's in, rough, in roughly speaking the task of, I have uh, an article and there might be a mention hidden inside, for instance, Daimler, and now my question is, does this mention point to an entity? And if there are some, which of these different Daimlers is it? Is it maybe the Mr. Daimler who founded this? Is it Daimler the company? And there might be like other Daimlers living in Germany. So in particular in this case, well, if we have that link, then we know, okay, there is like this entity with the luggage tag Daimler AG or Daimler Incorporated or other ways that you can refer to this kind of company, uh, which is re related to the category of autom automobile industry, uh, is kind of related to Volkswagen in some means, and it goes by the name of like car innovation industry, and there's like, we also have the whole Wikipedia article, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have like more information just based on having this one entity link here. Okay, um, right. So here like three or so sources of how to find uh, relevant entities. There's actually a fourth one which I'm gonna skip in the interest of time and people can certainly make up a fifth and a sixth one. So for instance, here's like a idea number one. We take this text, throw it into an entity linker. Entity linker says, oh, here we have Daimler and it's referring to this kind of company. Second approach is uh, we use our Wikipedia index or Freebase index. We just take this here as a query, just run it against the search index and see which pages we get out. Because I said everything that has a Wikipedia page is an entity. By ranking Wikipedia pages, we now have ranked entities. It's my second source of entities. The third also is a little bit more complicated. It's like I take this query and I run it against a full text uh, web corpus, for instance. Now um, I can get a ranking of documents out of this. Let's pretend that the top 10 of these documents would be relevant. They're not, but let's pretend that they are. In which case we can throw them through an entity link or get different entity links out of it and then assume that these entities are relevant. So that's a technique called pseudo-relevance feedback, and it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's like another weak indicator of what's relevant here. So you're looking for, you're looking for known related entities, right? So uh, if nobody knew that Daimler actually caused 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, something like that, then you wouldn't discover it this way. You're not, you're not after unknown relationships. Yep, yeah. But I mean, for instance, when I, put this query into uh, DuckDuckGo, I already get some pages that are actually on topic. 
So um, this is like, it's not completely boldly go where no one else has even thought about before, but can I find that knowledge that's really out there and just put it in like a nice Wikipedia-like shape, okay? Um, all right, so there's like more ways of finding these. I don't wanna talk about this right now. You can always reach out to me and I tell you uh, another 20 minutes about this. Um, what is this good for? Here's for instance, one simple example. Um, in a publication that I had with Jeff Dalton and James Allen in 2014. So if you would have these kind of entities here, and we have these different kinds of information associated with them, we can now rank documents by whether they, for instance, have an entity link to this entity that we really thought was relevant. Kind of solves in some ways like some disambiguation problem for us. But maybe this is like not enough because every entity linker makes mistakes and uh, maybe even had like slightly different entities. So let's combine with some other information such as do we have the right uh, query terms? Do terms from that article here like those already appear in these pages? Uh, do we have different kind of names? Maybe some of these names are more reliable than others uh, to kind of like catch some of these uh, mistakes. So we can rank documents with this one and we solve an ancient old information retrieval task called ad hoc document retrieval. Given a web style query, can we rank documents to have the relevant documents on top? It's not exactly what I was going on here, but this is really something where it's useful and we kind of like broke, um, set new standards on like collections that to some extent were like 10 years old. So it's um, just a sign that there's finally some NLP technology that really helped IR. So if you find an IR person saying, we don't need you guys, say, point them to this kind of work. Um, right. So that's just uh, an example. And um, yeah, this is just the slide that shows what we put. If you put this all together, it actually helps. Um, right. So let's talk about the connections between entities or relations. So who in this room knows about relation extraction? Okay, uh, seems like everybody knows about anti-linking, also knows about relation extraction. Let's have a strong correlation here. So for those that didn't raise their hands, so here's a cartoon version of relation extraction. We have a document, this document contains a sentence, and maybe, as in our case, we really have some entity links, so we know which of these words refer to certain entities, that's great. But what we don't know is in which relation they are, and if they are in any, like in this case, we have a relation extract that tells us these two gentlemen are in a works for relationship. Okay. Um, there was, I remember I was participating in Tech KBP for a couple of years and people uh, thought, oh, we do this because, well, if we apply that to relevant documents, now we have relevant relations. And I was like, okay, that's actually a good question. Is this really true? So our research question was relevant documents plus relation extraction equals relevant relations, question mark. Okay. Uh, which is like in uh, some joint work with Michael Schumacher, Ben Roth, uh, Simone Ponsetto, and myself from last year. So um, the setup that we used here, kind of like being like half an information retrieval person, it's like we used these queries, we found relevant, relevant documents on that topic, we entity linked them, now we ran a relation extractor on this one and we just checked are these relations that we find really relevant. Any guesses? Yes, okay, it's relevant. So let's say it's yes in half of the cases. So, okay, so he, what, let me first walk you through this visual notation. So we have, so our goal was to have relations that are not just correct, but they're also relevant on topic. So we took web search queries of, one of them was Raspberry Pi. Um, and we, from previous work, we already had some gold standard of which entities are actually relevant for these kind of uh, questions. So these are the green guys here. These are our entities. Um, now we have relations that came out of the system, which are either the, these guys, like the, the black uh, solid ones or the black dashed ones. We already removed all the relations that were just incorrect extractions. These were in this case 50%, which was better in the system than um, yeah, what that system achieved at Tech KVP. Actually, I didn't mention this one. It was uh, Ben Roth's system, which was kind of like placed as one of the best system at Tech KVP in 2013, I believe. Um, so it was a pretty good system, and in Tech KVP, it had 30% precision. In our case, it had 50% precision, so it was actually maybe even like an easier task than we would usually have at TAC. Um, so what we found that among all these correct extractions, these here were the correct ones, but we also found as least as many 
incorrect ones. I mean, not incorrect, but just like non-relevant ones. All right, let me actually go here. So uh, these were like 50-50. So there are many relevant relations. That's good. But there are also like many non-relevant relations. So the follow-up question is, how can we find those? Um, we also looked at a knowledge graph. where we, Here we used DBP there. So we asked, here we found a relation that was extracted. Can we find another relation on DBpedia? And in this case, for instance, like alma mater. Okay. Um, and we found that if we kind of like, uh, and then we asked whether the relations that we extracted, if we also find them in the knowledge graph, does this make them more relevant or not? And we found no correlation. Okay. Um, then the bigger problem is, this is what I tried to say down here, is that for 60% of these web search query, the schema was just simply inappropriate. So inappropriate that I thought, well, we don't even need to try. Um, yeah. So um, this is the problem when you have a schema uh, for the relation extraction, which is mostly about people and companies, and now you want to know about how the butterfly landed on the moon. It just it's like, doesn't really tell you about this. Okay. Um, right. So what we found is, again, um, if you only look at correct extractions, we find many relevant relations. That's good. But also half of them were like non-relevant relations. And whether the relation was, no was contained in the knowledge graph was like uncorrelated. Right. So now we thought, OK, that was supervised schema-based relation extraction. How about if we move to an open information extraction system? So that was like our next work with uh, master student Amina Kadri and me, uh, just uh, appeared at Sigaya this year. And again, we found that also for OpenIE, we found 50% of the correct extractions were just not on topic. Okay. And then we actually, uh, so with Amina, we did a more thorough experiment where we showed annotators one sentence and some extractions, and we asked them a whole bunch of different questions. Um, I'm going to talk more about this. But in, so in, in particular, we also asked them, does the sentence contain a relation? And is this relation relevant? And even there, we found 50%. So it's not that the systems don't work, any, don't work so well, and it's just a matter of having a better system. But it's about you know, um, just the fact that every document just like talks about some relations that are on topic and some other relations as well. OK, let's. Maybe you and I would only agree with 50%. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Right. Um, OK, but I think you know. I also looked at some of them. And it's just, you have, for instance, um, a sentence that says, x, y, and z states that something, something. So um, you would have a relationship because just this person said something, but it was not very important who said it. It was just that it was set. So, OK. Yes? I assume there is a trade off of uh, how many to recall and how many are wrong. Well, how can you say 50%? Is this a particular point of, of Among all? This means all of them are set zero. Are you a particular operating point? Or just how many points? So, among all relations where either you, or among all sentences where you user said it contains a relationship, in 50% of the cases, the same user also said it's on topic versus not on topic. And among and all. Is there a threshold? And then instead of getting 50, now you get 30? Is there a threshold in that algorithm? Um, well, I think the threshold was my annotator. The annotator said, OK, this is now off topic, or this is something I wanted. So I mean, you can like, agree with Doug, who said, well, how did the annotators agree with each other with respect to this I'm annotation? About the algorithm, not about I see. The, lane, the ground truth is one thing, and then there's an algorithm that. Oh, 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 okay. So, so far, so so far, there was no algorithm. We just used the system and we just annotated the sentences and found and, and were asking, is this is this um, is this research assumption true or false? So that, that system was a box that you. Used. Right. So this, that was a system from uh, Luciano El Coro and Rainer Gemuller, and we just used it and we annotated it. So far, okay. I'm going to talk more about that system in a second. Right, but we also just like ask users, here's a sentence, does it contain a relationship? Yes. Is this relationship on topic? And then they said in half of the cases they said yes, and the other half they said no. So my point is that it's just a problem to, even in the best extraction system, to then have a different 
phase that just of an algorithm to really say, okay, is this now on topic or not? Okay. Okay. Um, so let's maybe actually move on to more work on this like open relation extraction work. Okay. So just take for now the information that well there are relations in my relevant in my relevant documents that are just not on topic, not what I was not, not relevant for the query that I was asking. Okay. So let's talk about why these entities or relations are important. So it's kind of like this provenance finding, and you can think if you have a relation extraction system. But you just like look at the sentence that where that sentence actually where that extraction came from. Okay, so here's um, a variation of the track track that I personally like a lot, where we have um, why is this not stop working? Okay, so much for that. Now I take my. I hope you see this little dot here. So here, query. We want to find the relevant passages just directly for this query. No outline in the setup. I know which entities are relevant, but can I find some support passages for why this entity is relevant for the query? It's kind of like similar with the relations, but just for entities. And maybe I can use relation extraction to help me find these passages. Right? For instance, here's an example. If I have a passage that says, this entity is an ingredient for, and this is like my, one of my query terms, I can identify, oh, there is a relationship, entity ingredient of uh, some query, and we can, indu we can um, from that one, we can take that that is maybe a good, like that this underlying paragraph is a good explanation for why this entity is relevant for the query. Um, here's another um, example, like a negative example. If we have a sentence like, Dr. X, who is married to our entity, says that this query is a fact. Um, so now we have two relations in here, like X is married to this entity, okay? And X states that Q, okay? But there's no direct relationship between uh, this entity and the query in this, in this sentence. And that actually is a situation that we ran into a bunch of times. So in this case, we want to say, well, this is not a good support passage for a relationship between the query and that entity. Maybe we need to look at a different support passage and not at this one. Clear? Any question? Okay. So. I can imagine that Dr. X is a more or less a nobody, and that it is a famous personality. Put it in context. <laughs> sure, but maybe we've. The query is about uh, the stress of being in a movie. <laughs> You're very dark today, I have to say that. Um, well, but maybe we find a different passage that is a little bit more directly on topic. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Um, so, this is just a quick walkthrough of how this clausy extraction system works, which uh, probably uh, some people in the room can explain better than me. Uh, so it's just based on some um, dependency parsing. Then we have some class extraction uh, from which we can like certain propositions are formed. This is actually one example sentence of uh, our experiment where, for instance, like the rules of golf are a, set of, a standard set of regulations, which is a simpler version of this convoluted sentence about the rules of golf are a standard set of regulations and procedures by which the sport of golf should be played. Um, that's actually something very typical. Here we actually looked at sentences on Wikipedia. Um, and while they're like grammatically correct and not as nasty as stuff that we find on the web, um, they're still relatively long and convoluted. So that's uh, definitely that was definitely one of the challenges that we ran into here. Um, so here is like this uh, the same table that I showed you a few slides back, where um, we had different candidate sentences, and we then asked users or asked annotators. Um, here, here's a sentence. Does the sentence contain a relation? Okay. Not all sentences do. Um, and we also, uh, so our goal was to answer uh, annotation question one Does the sentence explain the relevance of this entity that we give it? Okay. And uh, we kind of had these other questions that we asked the annotators as well something like, contains a relation? Is this relation relevant? And now here's an extraction out of the system. Mm -hmm. And is any of these extractions kind of like relevant or on topic so that we could then build on top of that? Um, we also compared it with respect to some heuristics, such as does the sentence contain the query term? Yes, no. Does the sentence contain this entity? Yes, no. And we find that um, if we would actually find relevant relations, if we have a good oracle for that, we actually get a much higher precision versus like the, the query term heuristic. 
So if you get the query terms, you match a whole bunch of different sentences, but our precision could just be improved if you would find, if you would have a way of taking these relationships, identifying which ones are relevant, and then using that. Um, um, but of course, in like this sentence, and I think someone here already said that, well, we have this problem with that this system was maybe a little bit trained more for precision than for recall, so we're actually losing out on recall by, by quite a bit. Um, okay, so that was just, we wanted to check whether we actually had any hope for that. Um, and then we actually included it in a, in a prediction pipeline. This is now where we really use a method um, for this one, Baker method um, around this one, where we had uh, some candidate sentence extraction, which in this case was a little bit simplistic. We just take pages from Wikipedia and just take all of these sentences. Uh, we ran the relation extraction on top of that uh, and extracted some features. So these are kind of like triples. We get something like subject, verb, object. Um, of course, Clausy also gives you know, like quintuples, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we asked, for instance, like one of the features was, um, is the entity in the subject position and the query term in the object position? Okay, one feature. And then we kind of like shuffle this and we had a bunch of other features as well. And we also included some features based on TF-IDF, uh, something where we just used named entity recognition with respect to different types, some Palo speech tagging features. We used some dependency pass features based on ideas from Limin Yao's um, relation extraction paper, just using like the dependency path that connects our entity and one of the query terms, or like ask for what's on that. And we had some features from Clausy, like what I just explained up here. We took all these features, stuck them into learning to rank with our ground truth because we really annotated all these sentences and got a ranking of passages by relevance at the end. So how well was this actually, was this approach doing? If we take everything together, we get significant improvements over just a TFIDF baseline. But, of course, if you look at it in perspective, but well, here we have TFIDF. Using this open IE relation extraction is uh, essentially as good as TFIDF. Um, While well, the dependency pass and uh, named entity recognition didn't really work so well, which is kind of like what we expected. And if we take all of these together, well, we get a tiny little bit of improvement, which is maybe enough to write a paper, but not, it's, it's not enough to get really excited about it. So why do the relation extraction features not help more? Uh, I don't have the answer quite yet, so if you have any ideas, please let me know. So here's um, what I think is going on. Um, first of all, this relation extraction system was missing 30% of relevant relations, of or sorry, correct relations. So we're really missing out just by not finding all relations. And of these, again, the typical 50% were just like not relevant. That was really what we find before. And in some ways, we come like really having a recall issue here. So 13% of all sentences that were annotated were actually good explanations, but only 3% of sentences actually have relevant extractions. So there's kind of like another 10% that's missing. Um, so if we do some math and compute what is like the possible upper bound of a mean average position value, that was like our metric for ranking, that we could possibly achieve, we land at uh, 0.41, which was exactly what we achieved. So one could make a point that we maybe actually maxed out whatever we could have possibly achieved just based by this extraction. One of the reasons why I'm here today and explain you and tell you about this is please give me a better system and I'm happy to run this study again. Um, so we need a relation extraction system with higher recall at reasonable precision. Right, this is why I'm here. <laughs> So on in particular, maybe something like where I don't just get the one best uh, prediction, but maybe give me maybe the second best and so on, if I can get some confidences or if I can get a ranking, but at least they have something that I can then possibly fix in the downstream system, where if I'm just not getting the information, I cannot really fix it very well. Okay. Um, okay. So if there are no particular questions other than Ben wanting me to sell his system, um, I'm, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Ben, did you hear that? Good. <laughs> Any more questions? 
So again, this he was, it was just finding the explanation by one of these entities, let's say uh, nitrogen oxide, is relevant for this larger query, right? So it's just find me just, an, just some support for this one little fact, so that then I can piece together the whole story. All right. So there's a last bit about organizing knowledge into an essay and, uh, well, you know, research in progress. Um, invite me next year. Maybe I have a better um, explanation for this one. Okay. So um, here's the, actually the conclusion slide of this talk. So I was trying to talk about how can we retrieve complex answers through knowledge graphs and text. And um, I think that in order to provide a comprehensive and complex answer, it helps to find relevant entities, relations, and explanations, and have these two together, knowing very well that this is not everything. In particular, once we have them, we still need to solve this problem of putting it into like a nice article where I think we can, for instance, like steal from like some template, template learning algorithms. Um, here again is the URL to this track complex answer retrieval track, in case someone is interested to play with the data. We have data for the track up there. We also have a whole bunch of other resources up there that could possibly be useful. If you can't find it, uh, send me an email. And uh, here's also the URL to the KG4IR workshop, which I call it series. So far we only had one instance, but we hope to turn it into a series and maybe also have a special issue. So if you're interested in making um, information extraction and knowledge graph construction useful for information retrieval or have any crazy idea, uh, you should definitely um, watch out for the series. We're definitely interested in hearing, hearing more and having a more heterogeneous crowd here. All right. I'm happy to take your questions. More questions. <laughs> you all questioned out already? Okay. No, I'm never right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can imagine that you could get back too many different things uh, using the kind of strategy you were describing before, and some of them would overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about ways that you might try to winnow down the overlap, and it started to feel like a problem of summarizing mm -hmm. the concatenation of all the original documents. What's the relation between this problem and mm -hmm. summarization? Yeah, it's definitely, that's definitely like one of the big next steps, right? Once we, once we identify the stuff that's kind of like good and relevant and should go there, how can we not just bring it into order? How can we identify like certain like subtopic structure? How can we also just like summarize it in some ways? Like do we just select one? Or do we take bits of each of those and just combine them together? Do we maybe create completely like new language out of that one just based on that information that we find that's... Um, yeah, very interested in, in that. I don't have so any so answers yet. Happy if at the first stage you got, uh, you know, 20 or 50 times more than you were going to keep and then just uh, concatenated and then summarized. That's, in other words, is the, is the reason that you divided it into a generation phase and a selection phase just because indexing all the documents is hard and so you, ah. you want some <laughs> hybrid whole thing to call back raw material for summarization? Well, I think uh, summarization on like a whole large web collection. First of all, I'm also not really necessarily sure whether that actually helps you actually come up with a good answer. You could say, well, we just bake all that like retrieval thing into the summarization, and it's like, okay, sure, why not? So maybe some of these things would kind of like happen under the hood together with the summarization phase. I mean, clearly at the moment, um, this is just trying to nibble away on this larger problem, trying to come up with algorithms that, that solve some part of it, um, being po completely aware that oh, maybe this was all just like a, a failed attempt and actually a completely different solution would be the right one. So, yeah. Think, so the question was, is there any uh, work on multilingual? Um, I think there's some work on multilingual entity linking. Um, I mean, this, I just tried to actually establish this one actually as a problem to begin with. Um, I don't know if there any multilingual relation extraction work, maybe also something that would extract from multiple languages at the same time, so maybe we can like reason about these two extractions together. Um, I don't, maybe you know more about this. Um, um, a multilingual information retrieval may talk to, uh, talk to Doug, right? So he also knows more about this than I do. Um, but I think there is definitely um, an angle to this problem that 
cause for multilingual reasoning. I mean, again, what I said earlier about uh, understanding Euroscepticism or like uh, different ki how different kinds of cultures view one particular topic differently, right? Now you actually need some idea of multilingual multilinguality to bring all these different things together to actually uh, have it like all on one on one sheet to actually um, look at it, right? Um, and maybe look at it with like further computational methods, right? I, I thought one sort of natural fallout of your way of looking at this as an entity-centric or entity-relation-driven way of getting to your conflict answer is that it automatically addresses my first worry that certain aspects of the answer might be overrepresented in the data and also the end of the data. That way you'll see the same entity and the same relation. But you can see those dimensions. Right. And I mean, now the question is, is the, most, is the majority fact maybe just a fake news story, right? So that's kind of like another thing that we run into. I mean, that's... Hmm? I have another point there, which is that sometimes an important entity might not be in direct relation to the query, but one part. That's right. Yeah. And these are exactly the... Once you get to it, mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think there's a sense of in your method whether you'll ever reach them or how mm -hmm. important they are in your... So there are some ongoing work on how can we find the entities that are not directly, I mean, the directly related ones, they're easy to find. I mean, these, uh, Daimler, in this example, I mean, we can find it, that's like, but that's like how kind of obvious. How can we find the relevant stuff that's not obvious? So I have some ideas on that. So again, invite me next year again. Maybe I have some solutions for that one. Well, it can go into inference. I think um, I think there's also maybe an, an easier approach other than um, I mean. So there's kind of like so one of the one of the things I didn't like about semantic web when I looked at it ten years ago was the idea of we take the text, now we extract the facts from this text, we put it in the knowledge graph, maybe merge it with other knowledge graphs, and now everything we ever want to know is in that knowledge graph. We never we never need to go back to the text, and I think this is just I don't, I'm very pessimistic that this is the right approach because maybe while you're extracting stuff, you didn't really know what the user really wanted. So by then not extracting this one particular fact, you've already lost. You can never recover from this one. Where if you use the knowledge graph as a kind of backbone to drive which are the pieces of text that I should look at, and then maybe let's focus more on these pieces of text. I mean, there's, uh, I think Jamie Teven had this paradigm called slow search, where you would ask the question, then you go home, have, wife, have dinner with your partner, have a good night's worth of sleep, then come back in the morning, and then you get a really nice portfolio. So we could maybe have a slow search scenario where we do some relation extraction on the fly after we really looked at some text. We don't need to give the answer in like 10 milliseconds, but maybe we can actually take some more time but come up with something a little bit more uh, fundamental, right? And find these, find these entities that are further away, uh, but maybe go back to the text and make sure you're not just like walking off topic. Okay, so I hope I'm not gonna not gonna make any enemies, but I see uh, OpenIE as maybe a way, kind of like as a parser of complicated winded sentences to break it down into something simpler and something where proximity makes more sense. Like, you know, these like crazy languages like German that suddenly put the verb at the end of the sentence. Who came up with that, right? Um, so if you would have, and in some ways I think like of open IE as you know, the thing that kind of like takes this verb and just puts it into the predicate position um, so that we can actually identify what does actually proximity really mean here. Or to, if you have an apposition, to just, you know, get rid of that one. I mean, in some ways, you know, dependency parsing already gave us this, you know, cutting out certain like parts of the, of the sentence. Um, but I think there is maybe some, but so we have like raw text and we have dependency parsing, we have open IE. We kind of like trying to go from the other end. And maybe there are kind of like a few more steps that we could imagine to go on top of open IE that would go into this direction, onto like more higher level semantics, but in a way that we can always fall back to the text 
we can, if I say, oh, no, no, that was not really what's relevant, I think this thing here was more relevant, you can take that and kind of go back uh, to the, uh, like, once to one step lower in that, in that pipeline. So I think um, there's possibly some, something, something else, but because I'm not an OpenAE expert, I'm happy to, like, hear about uh, any ideas in that direction. Yeah. Thank you.